Hey, good afternoon, Davina. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I, I am. I'm good. I'm great. So um, can you just explain a little bit about what Mabex does and your role within Mabex? Okay, so Mabex has been around since 1985. We were established to assist Malaysian students who want to study in the UK. So we help students through the whole application process. So everything from the initial thought of should I study in the UK, all the way through the whole UCAS application, helping them with personal statements, but also um, we help them with things like visas, choosing the right accommodation, um, that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's what Mapex does. Uh, I am the executive director of Mapex. Okay, and I guess you've speak, been speaking to a lot of students um, lately since, since this whole thing happened and the MCO began. And, and, and what's the kind of feel that you're getting for from students as to their main concerns? I think for the most part, students um, are really keen to go to the UK uh, in the autumn. Uh, their main concerns seem to be around the new assessment methods that are in place for um, all the different exam boards. So it's not just the A-level students, but also the IB students and students in Malaysia who are doing local qualifications. They're concerned about that. Um, they're also concerned about whether or not um, the UK universities will be able to start the term as planned in September or in, in some cases in October. Uh, there are also some concerns about whether or not the UK universities will consider running the first term online or whether they will push the term to January. So these are the sorts of things that students are worried about. I, I think um, it seems to be the case, however, that first and foremost, they are concerned about their safety. So they want to feel that the UK is a safe place to go to um, in, in September, October, whatever it is the terms. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, I, as you know, because we work um, together quite a lot, um, I'm at College Tunku Jaffa and um, we, we ha have conversations with our students all the time and we have anecdotal evidence about what the student body is thinking and what they're planning. But then you did this um, great survey where you actually surveyed the Malaysian students. And um, I think it offers us a great insight into what all of them as, as a body are um, actually thinking about. And can you just explain how you um, started the survey and, um, um, and how you've structured that? Um, so the survey came about because we had been receiving uh, a lot of inquiries from our UK partners as to whether or not we felt Malaysian students uh, were feeling confident about going to the UK in the autumn term. And we also felt like we needed to understand what our students' needs are in, you know, in, the, in the coming months as we build towards starting, uh, well, them leaving to go to university. So I think the fundamental questions were really about what they felt were the key things that they were thinking about um, when thinking about their future. So it's more, it was more to do about like, have you thought about your future? Mm. So um, who took part in the survey? So we surveyed students who have applied to study in the UK using the Abexa services. Uh, there were about uh, 1,200 students from all across the country really. So uh, different schools and colleges around Malaysia, both in uh, East and West Malaysia. Okay. Uh, they are students who are doing, as I said, a range of qualifications. So anything from A-levels, to IB, to diploma programs, STPM, uh, UEC, matriculation. So they're all um, people who are thinking of starting their first year yeah. in the autumn. Um, and what were the main conclusions then that, that came out? So 83% of all the students who responded to the survey, so we had quite a good response rate, something like 35% of the students that we emailed uh, actually responded to the survey. So it shows us that they are concerned yeah. about, about their future. Um, so the, the main takeaways are this, so like I said, 83% of the students said that they do want to start university as planned. Um, most of them are willing to consider an extension to the start date. So let's say, uh, you know, university has to push the start date by a month. 
mm. or even by a whole term. So let's say that the autumn term doesn't doesn't happen and it starts in January and it's a bit more compressed. Students are okay with that. There so are most, sorry, sorry, most students were happy about extending um, the vacation so that they'll start yeah. in say, October, November. Yes. Um, the, I mean, the, 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 most of the students, so like something like, I think it was 31% or 32% of the students said, can we just start as normal? Yeah. I mean, everybody would love that, but I, I, I think it seems a little bit unrealistic. Um, and then the next category down with the students said, okay, I, I'm happy to wait till October or November to start my term. And then the next category down were like, okay, you know, we could consider a January start. Um, but most of them were not keen on the idea of having the first semester online, you know, the first term online, and then going to the UK for the second term. Um, so what, in the what new was year. their, sorry, what, what was their view of online learning then? Is, is it something that's attractive to them? No, it, it really proved to be unattractive to most of the students that we surveyed. Um, and of the students who said, okay, I'm willing to consider online learning. Most of them said that they would expect a discount uh, or reduction in their tuition fees for that first That's semester. That's not what universities are saying, right? <laughs> no, I know, but, but it, is, it, is, it is what the students have said that because they won't get that face-to-face that -face engagement that um, is quite an essential part of your university experience, uh, that small group learning, uh, those are the, 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 the benefits of the sort of differences in, in going to university as compared to secondary school. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think students are, are less keen on that and, and especially for students who are doing lab-based programs, you yeah. know, if you're doing engineering or a first year medic, for example, you, you, I don't think you want to start your first term learning online. So I think those are some of the considerations that the students raised. Um, and we have shared the uh, results with the university, so they are aware that these are the things that the students are thinking about. Yeah. So, I mean, Maybex has been doing this for many years. Um, and I just wondered if you have a feel for the level of uncertainty in people's plans. So about 17% are saying they don't know what they're going to do yet. In a general normal year in a cohort, how many would be unsure about what they're doing? Would it be higher than 17% than would be unsure or lower? No, it wouldn't be higher than 17%. I think uh, the bulk of our students um, apply because they're pretty sure they want to go to the UK. Mm. Um, we get students generally at that point where they've already committed to doing a qualification that's recognized in the UK. So as I said, mm. IB or A-levels, and um, they're pretty sure that they've got the funding um, or they're being funded by the government um, to yeah. go to the UK. So they've made their choice. So 17% um, is actually a pretty high uh, percentage for, of, of students who are unsure at this stage. And the anecdotal evidence suggests that it's because they don't feel that um, by the autumn, for example, the UK would be particularly safe. Do you know what I mean? Because of um, the number of cases of coronavirus. Um, yeah, those are the, the sorts of things students are worried about. It so you did ask the question, if you're not thinking of going to the UK, you're thinking of somewhere else. And um, where mm -hmm. else were they thinking? And, and is that because they were thinking of going there anyway? Or is that because of coronavirus? Uh, interesting. I think <laughs> the, the survey was done before the numbers went up significantly in Singapore. So mm -hmm. a lot of students actually said that Singapore was their next choice um, or China, because I think China has sort of moved away from being the epicenter of the pandemic. Mm. So um, yeah, students mentioned China and Singapore, but if you look at the survey results, the bulk of them have said, you know, we, we would much rather go to the UK than consider, and if we do, oh, and some mentioned the USA, but again, the survey was done before the numbers in the US went up to what they are now. Okay, really? I, I we, did the survey again because another question we asked was would you consider doing your UK degree in Malaysia because as you know lots of UK universities have campuses here and the answer was no like it was a, a solid no but last week the most visited page on uh, Maybex's website was getting your UK degree in Malaysia wow okay so, so in the last couple of weeks 
that there's been that shift that sort of like oh maybe i should consider my options here in asia yeah yeah so it goes to show what a very fluid and rapidly changing situation this is of course it's really is. Is a very different position now yeah so mm -hmm. the other statistic that was um, quite high i thought was 25 percent of them weren't sure on their funding is that higher than usual and is that um a feature of the fact that there's so much economic turmoil in Malaysia at the moment? 100% because again, um, if you look at the survey, so th that's the statistic, but then if you, if you drill down, you'll find that um, students have actually given honest answers as to why they, they've not got the funding secured anymore. So the, there were several students who said things like, my family business um, is experiencing difficulties. So I suspect it's people who uh you know come from families where they run smes and they're struggling with you know running the business in the lockdown and getting any income um and so as a consequence that idea of going abroad is sort of slipping away because the cost is yeah they just can't afford it anymore yeah what are the um options for people looking for external funding to help them um well it's a little bit tricky at the moment i think some of the uk universities have started saying things like um anyone who uh starts in whenever well, the autumn will get a tuition fee reduction uh some universities have, have set up uh, hardship funds for students who would like to apply for scholarships um you know but it's a couple of thousand pounds it's not going to be the entire cost of, mm. of um, their course. So it's a little bit uncertain at this point. Um, there aren't a lot of external funding bodies that are putting their hands up to say, you know, we have some scholarships available. Um, that said, Mara did release some scholarships uh, sometime towards the end of March um, okay. for postgraduate study. I mean, it's, it's a different category, but um, the government bodies in Malaysia seem to be keen to continue funding students to study overseas so it just remains to be seen whether that, that can happen but if you're if you've got a place and you're looking for funding now it's i think it's a little bit tricky yeah um i know it wasn't really part of your survey but um what's your advice on the concerns students have for the english language requirement because obviously um it's not possible to do certain exams like ielts at the moment mm -hmm. So the good thing about Malaysian students or students who have done an international, um, you know, syllabus uh, is that for the most part, UK universities recognize um, your IGCSE English. If you've got a grade C and above, for the most part, you're okay. Uh, even if you've done SVM and you've done 1419, you're also okay. Um, for undergraduate students, um, as long as the UK university chooses to recognize your qualification, there's no issue with the visa application. UK universities have also started providing alternative qualifications. They've tied up with organizations like Duolingo to provide um, online testing so that students can actually do an alternative test online from home, for example. Um, and some universities are being a bit more flexible uh, with the with the entry requirements for English language. So um, a lot of them, it, it, this doesn't really apply to Malaysian students generally, but it does to students from China, for example, who tend to need to do the pre-sessional English language programs. They're starting to run those online or they're reducing the IELTS requirements by say 0.5. So if you need to get six, they're saying, okay, you can come with 5.5. Um, so they're, they're being a bit more flexible, but I think Malaysian students who are worried about whether or not they've got the English language grades, you, you, you will find the information on the university's website. We usually have a page for Malaysia and they'll say, okay, we recognize SBM 1019 English, we recognize IGCSE English. And then if you don't have either of those, there will be alternative tests for you to do. Yeah. So um, it's no longer a requirement that you need the IELTS for your visa then? Uh, no, you don't. Uh, for undergraduate study. So if you're if you're going for a BA or BSc or MBBS, whatever, um, it's not a, a requirement uh, to apply for the visa. 
it only applies to students who are uh, are going to do a foundation program. So anything below uh, an undergraduate degree level. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a big benefit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So generally, students are, are really unsure about um, what to do in terms of their university choices and whether they should go and funding. Where are the good places for them to actually find out information in this rapidly changing situation? So a lot of the universities have uh, a page dedicated to issues related to COVID. Mm -hmm. So you can go to the university's page and you can get the latest information about COVID and about decisions that the universities are making around start dates or online learning. Um, so that's a, that's a good place to go to. Um, you can also speak to Maybex. Uh, where our offices are not open, but uh, you can reach us by email or you can use a call. You can arrange to have a Skype uh, meeting with one of our counselors and they can walk you through the decision making process that you might need to go through. Um, they can also help you to source um, for scholarships. So um, the universities do send us information regularly. So we actually have a scholarships database. So if you have an offer from your university and you think, I really want to go, but I'm a bit short. Uh, I don't know if I can get funding. Um, just give us a call or drop us a text, and we'll be able to let you know what the options are. Okay, that's good. How, in your conversations, I suppose you've been to many university webinars over the last few weeks. Um, what's your general feel for, for how the mood has changed? And is there anything in that mood that you can find to reassure students out there? I think most universities are working on the basis that it's going to be business as usual um, in the autumn. That, that's how they're, they're operating. That seems to be the sense that I'm getting from most of the um, webinars or meetings I've had. Uh, that said, some universities have begun to shift their um, start dates. So we've got a couple of universities now that have moved their start of term to the end of October. And then there are some universities that already have January intakes anyway, who are saying students have the choice of deferring to January if they prefer. If they feel, okay, I'm not sure that autumn is, is a go, um, they'll, they'll let you defer your place to January. And, and, and every university I've spoken to so far has said, if students really don't want to come in 2020, we will hold their place to 2021. Okay, that's interesting. So there's always an option to request for a referral if for whatever reason you feel you don't want to go. Um, that said, I think it's best if students, if they've got all their offers already on UCAS, do make your firm and insurance choices. Don't let your offers slide, you know? So if you, you have a deadline by which you have to make your decision, do it. Even if you're not sure whether you're going or whether there's funding, any of these things, hold on to that place and then we can talk about it in the next couple yeah. of months to make that right decision. Yeah. Yeah. How flexible do you think the universities will be with near misses? Because I, I wondered about the, the grade system that they're coming up with, um, because you know, the top universities over offer on the presumption that people are going to miss the grades. And yet they seem to be saying we're going to be very flexible with near misses. Is that because they expect far fewer applicants and that there's going to be quite a bit of, leeway in terms of, of grades? I honestly don't know the answer to that. I think um, the universities that we have spoken to so far have said that they understand, because again, if you, if you look back at the survey, a lot of students were worried about the assessment method. Yeah. You know, the anecdotal um, evidence suggests that they're worried that this whole new system will mean that they will get a lower grade than what they were expecting for a variety of reasons. So universities are aware of that. They're aware that students need to be treated fairly. Um, but at the same time, you know, a near miss, even in a good year, it, it really just depends. Sometimes if it's one grade, you, you, you will still get in. And other times if it's one grade and absolutely not because all your peers have performed really well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just I just really think that universities are going to have to see how this assessment works. They're going to have a bit more time to deal with it rather than just, you know, the day the A-level grades come up. Um, so I, I yeah, think... Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So any last um, 
tips or, or words of advice uh, to parents or to students who, who are worried at the moment? I think, I think we have to approach things the way, I mean, I, I'm choosing to approach things at the moment, which is you worry about the things that you can control. So for example, making sure that you get all the right bits of paperwork in to make sure you get the grades that you need, right? So make sure you communicate well with your school, make sure you're doing all the right things to, um, to ensure that you're graded fairly. That's something in your control. Make sure you do make your decisions on your firm and insurance choices by the deadline. Again, another thing in your control. Don't worry too much about when the term is going to start, whether or not it's going to be online or not online. Those are things that are not in your control. So the other option, I suppose, and we, have, we genuinely have been encouraging students to think about it, is think about whether or not you might want to consider starting your degree here in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. You know, there are options available. It may not be your first choice, but it, these are the circumstances that we're in. So maybe try and get an offer or a, a, a program here in Malaysia. Mm. And then when the time comes and you can make that decision, you have options in front of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good advice. And I just think kind of be, be flexible and, and um, uh, something about this with my kids and we, we were saying that if the exact, I know students are very worried about this new grading system and it's very stressful, but if they were doing the actual exams and they were coming up to the actual yeah. exams, it that would be incredibly stressful. And then it's, it's all stress, but it's a different stress. And, and there's a point at which now, um, you know, the school's going to have to make those um, decisions, of, um, proposals to the exam boards about um, the grades that they think. And then you just have to sit back and let it take its course in the same way that if you've done the exam, there's nothing mm -hmm. you can do about it and you just have to wait for results day. So it, it's still stressful, but I think it's a slightly different stress. Um, exactly. That's why I said focus on the things that you can control and let, let the things that you can't control, you know, let them just go. Uh, you, yeah. you, you don't know. So you just yeah. do the things you can do. I mean, that's how I've been dealing with this lockdown, right? Yes. You know, it's a weird set of circumstances. Nobody loves this, but it is what it is. So try and, and do what you can to survive it. Yes. Um, is it okay for us to share this presentation at the bottom in, in the YouTube link? Can we share this with other people, your survey? Oh, or sure. Of it? Yeah, can? Okay, yeah, great. Sure. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was great. Thank really, you. really informative. And thank you for doing the survey and actually just kind of putting some concrete numbers to all that anecdotal evidence that we'd all been talking about. That's great. Okay, great. Thank, thank you very great. much. Good luck with the lockdown. Okay, Bye. thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.